So to kick off panel one is Terry Burke, who's a vice president at Edwards Life Sciences, who will introduce the first panel topic and the, mo and the panelists. Take it away, Terry. Great. Thanks, Deb. Well, good morning, everyone. Such a privilege to be here today. Um, it's one of my favorite meetings of the year, so I was excited to hear that we are in the 30s in the top 50. Um, so we will aspire every year to improve on that. Um, I'm really um, excited to talk to you today about uh, innovation in med tech and specifically outside the US. Um, we were talking up here before the panel started about Reggie's um, amazing talk this morning, and I think what it really highlights is the need for humanity. And I think that's a common theme that we can all think about today. And so as we talk about innovation, it's how do we combine innovation with humanity and think about that in new ways. So our goal for the next hour is to keep things moving really quickly to give you a lot of information. I have fantastic panelists. And we're gonna talk to you about different innovation models and hopefully encourage and inspire you to think differently about how to innovate um, particularly when we think about non-US markets. So with me today are my panelists, Sanaz. Uh, I have um, Anala, Jane, Josie, and Carolyn. And to kick us off, I'm just gonna ask each of them to give about one or two minutes quickly around what their uh, company or organization does and how they think about innovation differently outside the US. So Sanaz, can I start with you? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Sanaz. Thank you for the introduction, Terry. Um, I'm at Medtronic, and um, I've been with Medtronic for almost five years, and primarily in R&D, although I just switched over to marketing. Um, I kicked off a couple of programs um, I've been developing, been the technical lead, developing two products for the last few years, and now transitioned into marketing to help launch them. So I'll be able to speak to uh, what kind of approaches we took to innovate globally for the products that I've been on, as well as um, some uh, global efforts and global initiatives at a philanthropic level that Medtronic runs, as well as from corporate initiatives as well. I'm Anula, and I'm the co-founder of a healthcare-focused fund, actually two funds, um, focused on India. And we invest only in healthcare, both in products as well as healthcare delivery. And I would like to talk to you today a little bit about two types of innovation in India, one which is very familiar to you all and another that might be less familiar to you all. My name is Jane Chen. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Embrace Innovations. We're a social enterprise that makes low-cost baby incubators for developing countries. Uh, this is something that came out of the design school at Stanford, where I did my MBA. Um, the background of the problem is there are 15 million preterm and underweight babies born every year around the world. One of the biggest problems they face is regulating their own temperature, uh, and that's the primary function of an incubator. But incubators are expensive. They cost $20,000 upwards. They require constant electricity. You're not going to find them in rural areas where many of these babies are dying. Um, my team and I created a solution that I have here with me today. It looks like a little sleeping bag for a baby. Uh, the core technology is a pouch of a wax-like substance called a phase change material that can be melted uh, with hot water. And once melted, it maintains the exact same temperature of 90 degrees for up to eight hours at a stretch. Uh, and you can reheat this thousands of times. So this creates a warm uh, microenvironment for the infant. Uh, we spent four years in India getting this off to the ground. India is home to 40% of all the world's premature babies. Um, and today, we estimate we've helped over 200,000 babies across 20 countries. Hello, I'm Josie Everett. Um, I'm the executive director of Heart to Heart, which is a, about a 25-year-old nonprofit organization based here in Northern California. We identify large uh, underserved metropolitan areas that are poised to integrate pediatric cardiac care into their existing medical infrastructure. Um, we like to think of ourselves as giving them a cardiac hand up by providing advanced education and training and uh, strategic guidance to get them to become a self-sustainable program that can perform open heart surgery and cath-based procedures on children, um, infants, and newborns. Um, we've been doing this uh, primarily in Russia. We've uh, expanded last year into South America, and so far we have developed four self-sustaining centers. Um, we have foreign development, 
and um, the specialists that we've trained have saved the lives of over 20,000 uh, children with heart defects. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Carolyn Urena. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sisu Global Health, and we are a startup medical device company for emerging markets. And the challenge we're addressing is when, across the globe, when a doctor reaches for a blood bag, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's often not there. So there is an alternative to donor blood for cases of internal bleeding where you have blood that's pooled in a body cavity and that's autotransfusion. It's the process of recycling a person's own blood. Uh, and so we've created this very simple technology to replace the need for donor blood with a, looks a lot like a giant syringe to suction blood out through a filter transfer it to a blood bag so it can be retransfused immediately in surgery. And right now we've been fortunate enough uh, to be funded by uh, Steve Case, the founder of AOL, the Gates Foundation, both investment grants. And I'm hoping to talk to all of you today about some of that, that process that we're going through of designing for emerging markets. So really designing from the ground up with clinicians, with hospital systems, and with local governments to change the way medical devices are designed because right now 80% of our technology is made for 10% of the world so we need to do a lot better job at getting technology out to the rest of the world. So as you can see we have a power panel um, with some great experience. So thank you all. Um, I want to play a little bit on that theme of designing for affordability, designing for unmet needs. Uh, because a number of you have approached that from different angles. Not simply taking the model from the US that we're familiar with, but really thinking differently. So um, maybe, Jane, if I can start with you, tell us a little bit more about how this concept of design for extreme affordability came about with, with Sanford and your experience, and how you brought that product to life. And then I'll ask the others to jump in as well and talk about that. Sure, so our um, company, the idea started out of uh, the design class, uh, Design for Extreme Affordability at Stanford, where I worked with a team of engineers and the challenge posed to us at the time was to build a baby incubator that costs 1% of the cost of a traditional incubator, which is $20,000. So the class had partnered uh, with a nonprofit in Nepal that had identified this as a major need, lack of incubators. Um, and I think the design process that we learned really starts with empathy. So the first step was traveling to Nepal, traveling to India, and seeing the situation firsthand for ourselves. Um, and what we saw there was actually oftentimes there are donated incubators in these hospitals, so they're totally free of cost. And we go into these neonatal intensive care units that were completely overcrowded. Every baby was in need of incubation, and then there would be a donated incubator sitting in the corner of the hospital completely unused. Why? Because there's no electricity to power it. No one was trained on how to use these machines. If a part broke, there were no spare parts for replacement. So even when they were free of cost, there were systemic issues that led to these machines being totally um, unviable in these countries. From there, we traveled to um, the villages, and that's where we truly began to understand the problem. Um, I remember on one of my first visits to India, I uh, met a woman in South India, in a village in South India, who had given birth to her baby two months prematurely. She took her baby to a village doctor who advised her to go to a city hospital so her baby could be placed in an incubator. But that hospital was over four hours away and she didn't have the money to get there. And so her baby died. Uh, and we would hear dozens of similar stories everywhere we traveled. And I think it was based on um, understanding this that we realized what was needed was not just a lower cost version of what exists today, but something that works without a constant supply of electricity that's easy enough for a mother, a midwife, or a, a village healthcare worker to use. Um, and that's how we define what were the, um, uh, the things that we needed to create something that was portable, that could work without that constant electricity, that was super, super easy to use. Um, and with that, we developed the Embrace Incubator. Um, we then spent the next four years on the ground prototyping, co-creating with mothers, midwives, doctors, um, and really trying to make it uh, a locally appropriate product. So that whole process was one of constant prototyping, iterating, testing, going back and trying to understand even further. 
So along those lines, Tanaz, uh, you mentioned with Medtronic, there's a couple of initiatives to take a very large uh, med tech company and really think differently globally. And so uh, that concept of empathy and being out in the environment, tell us a little bit about your experiences in the, with the innovation program. Yeah, <clears throat> I have a couple of touch points with that. So there's, there's many levels and um, there are many people I'm sure here who are also with Medtronic, so I'm sure there's even more initiatives and efforts going on that even I'm aware of. But there's a couple that I have been involved with at Medtronic and one is at my uh, business unit level and the other is um, was a program through the Medtronic Foundation which runs philanthropic programs. So in both there are some parallels that really emphasize, like Jane is saying, the value of empathy. Um, with this uh, Global Innovation Fellowship Program that I participated in, it's, it's funded through the Medtronic Foundation and it's intended to be philanthropic, but obviously it's mutually beneficial because the employees are out in the field and they learn about the ecosystem that they're designing for and the differences in these emerging markets and how limited access is to healthcare in these geographies. So I spent a month living in South Africa um, and they partnered us, we were partnered with a local nonprofit organization and trying to work on expanding their um, diabetes screening programs outside of the urban areas and trying to do this in a financially sustainable way. So what's key is really the being out in the field it gives you a whole other level of the needs, your target customer, um, the environment, the capabilities, the training, and all of that goes into what your design inputs and your design outputs <coughs> should be. So. Um, we also carry forward this kind of, we use this kind of approach in uh, the program that I've been running for the last couple of years at Medtronic and my business unit level because we actually partnered with IDEO um, and so we used a lot of their design principles and approaches in terms of design thinking, uh, user-centric design, and really following, in that case it was the product, from when it enters into the hospital and whoever is receiving it, storing it, how it's used, how it's disposed, because it's looking through that whole continuum of care and the variety of stakeholders to really be able to identify where are all the pain points, where are the struggles, where are the issues that you can then transform into areas of opportunity to create better designs. So when you look at it through that lens, you see how many different people interact with the product, and there really can be a variety of touch points um, that perhaps they don't see as workarounds or issues, but it's, it's those nuanced details that you get from being in the field that you don't necessarily get through marketing surveys or meetings with uh, advisory boards and things like that. Interesting. And similarly, I think for you at, with Sisu, you've spent a lot of time on the ground. Um, so tell us uh, some similarities maybe from what, what you've heard these ladies speak to or some thing, different things that you learned that uh, I know you've partnered with some of the local government uh, programs as well. Yeah, definitely. So it, I think a lot of similarities. I think great design comes from really listening. And we were hearing that, I think, this morning in the, the patient keynote is sitting and observing and it, what, what actually is needed, not our preconceived notion of coming in of what we think is needed, but what is actually really needed on the ground. And so uh, for us, we came in and, and with that mindset of working with local doctors, working with not only what's needed by the doctor, but how is the hospital, a hospital is a business, so how is it making money and how do we work that into the original design <laughs> constraints for our product? So when we were observing on our device on kind of that blood recycling process, we were like, well, what, what happens when donor blood runs out? And we saw that really innovative doctors were using what solutions they could, which a simple mechanical method to use kind of a, a cup to scoop blood out, filter it um, often through gauze and put it back into the blood bag. And we dug down further and looked at, so is this happening because there's no money here? And, and actually looked at it and like, no, patients are paying over $100 per unit of donor blood um, upfront, out of pocket usually, um, when blood is available. So it's more about the, there's this gap in technology from um, kind of what the simplicity that's, that's required in a lot of the areas, like Jane was saying, that don't always have electricity um, and kind of the, the US technology that doesn't work in these markets. So creating from, from the ground up. 
um, working with um, all the stakeholders involved. So playing on that theme a little bit more, um, Josie and then Anil, I want to talk to you about India a little bit. But Josie, for you, um, you and I talked, your organization is a little bit of what I would call upstream of the medical technology. You have to go in and assess what kind of training is available and do the clinicians even have the skill set and capabilities to deliver different therapies. So tell us a little bit about how you develop the skill set um, in your clinicians that you partner with, what role the local organizations and governments play, um, and then how do you interact with new technologies and how do you then introduce technology? I want to start with the, the word that Jane brought up, which was empathy. And um, Heart to Heart is, it's a nonprofit organization, but essentially the staff is professionally organized as a very uh, tight-knit and strong network of, of cardiac specialists who volunteer their time for free. Um, and what we do is we coordinate uh, a program model that is applied to any partner site to get them up to speed over a period of about five to seven years. So it's the staff kind of coordinating this program model. The program model is flexible enough so that we can go to different sites and we can, um, we can understand where they're at in terms of, I'll use a very, I'll use pediatric cardiac care as a prime example, where they're at in terms of, of, um, of open heart surgery, in terms of catheter-based procedures and patient care and understand um, by looking at data, collecting data, where they're at and where they want to, where we want to get them, where they want to go, which is a mutually established goal at the beginning. So it's a matter of, um, it, it's really, the reason I wanted to start with empathy is because as cardiac specialists going into an area where um, they don't have the right TE probe, so they can't confirm a, a repair um, after, after surgery, understanding what their, what their limitations are, but understanding that they want to deliver the, the same quality of patient care that we do here. Um, and, and try to understand, that's where the empathy comes in because it's primarily, we're primarily um, cardiac specialists, to imagine being in that situation and what it's going to take to get them from, let's say, you know, C to Z. Um, so I think that, is that answer your question? How do you think about, so we talked a little bit about um, these really underserved markets and, mm -hmm. and in the case of Jane's organization looking in Nepal, no electricity or mm -hmm. inability to use some of the Western technology. Mm -hmm. So are the markets you're in, do they have to hit a certain threshold of yeah. capability? I imagine with surgery, it's a little bit different than looking at infant warmers. So tell us a little bit about how you think about when an underserved market is appropriate or really not yet okay. developed? So we're, we're really talking about what we call um, our site assessment process. We have a really rigorous um, site assessment process and um, to determine if what we can offer, because I totally agree with you that what we have may not be what somebody wants, so we have to find that fit. How does our, will our program model succeed to get a pediatric cardiac team to reach self-sustainability within five to seven years. So we're not the type of group that builds hospitals or only supplies equipment. Um, we are the type of organization that can um, provide advanced education and training and best practices and work with a complete nascent team and get them up to, up to speed. So before we can do that, the, the site assessment, I took notes so I wouldn't uh, forget any of them, but um, the first cut for us is political stability. Um, we don't go into war-torn areas, for example. We want to keep our medical volunteers safe, but there are a lot of groups that, that do, and our hats are off to them. Um, general infrastructure for open heart surgery and cath-based procedures. Um, we need to get in and out. We need, we need to be able to get in by air, by car. We need electricity. We need running water. Um, we are talking about tertiary care, so uh, there has to be some kind of medical infrastructure that we can build on. There have to be people that we can train. And maybe this sounds really obvious, but um, in, in the world that I roam in, um, you know, we had a conference a couple years ago in Geneva, and somebody actually spoke about five years into a project, they didn't have any MDs to train. And I thought, how could you have not seen that up front? You know, it's so important. So the, the area has to have 
um, a talent pool that, that we can train. Um, basic equipment and supplies, um, what is their general surgical capability, maybe adult cardiac capability, and safe blood supply. One of the really big things is the political and financial will uh, among key stakeholders. Um, that's a really big one, and that really needs to be determined on the ground, mm. on-site meetings. You can only do so much U.S.-based research, and you've got to you've got to get on the ground. You've got to meet with people from all different levels and who the natural stakeholders are. I wonder on that one, um, that aspect of kind of the financial and the the political will will. If that's something you see in India, Anala, in terms of you're bringing a very different business model for and an innovation model that's different, but I imagine there's a need to also find ways to partner with the government when possible. So we haven't directly partnered um, with the government. We are a traditional venture fund. We've, we've deployed as today $250 million in healthcare in India. Um, the way we interact with the government is that so in some of the hospitals there are patients who are covered by um, the coverage for indigent patients. Um, but what I'd like to sort of say is that um, we, our impact, social impact is indirect because we are really uh, financial investors Funding um, companies. In, in India. And we have sort of taken an ecosystem approach to understand markets um, and patients a little bit differently. So for, uh, let me take the orthopedics example. So we are investors in orthopedic hospitals. We have an investment in hip and knee trans, um, device manufacturer. And then we also have an investment in a uh, physical therapy and prosthetics and orthopedics. So we are, we are looking at, you know, Amy talked about the post um, surgical part, which is not there. So we have a way of sort of understanding um, all, as many parts, or many parts of, of the ecosystem mm -hmm. with our investments. And something we found is that asking doctors what they want is mixed. It doesn't really, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I'm a doctor, so I can say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially in India, they will say they want a thousand things, and then when you, I have had the experience of when you deliver it, they don't use it. And, and so I, I've learned to frame that question um, differently. Um, but let me just take a segue and say, something that has really intrigued me um, in the orthopedic space is that, uh, so this is anathema to many of you, but we do generic devices, like generic drugs. They make them very affordable, so it has a place, and and they are we're not violating patents, and and one of the things that our hip device does, um, and I wonder that whether even I, having you know being bicultural, would have realized this, but what it does is it has degrees of flexibility and turn, so that Indians like to um, squat and they sit squatting, and the Western devices don't do that. And nobody had noticed because design teams are generally Western, and, and these are subtle things that you might not get. And so, the one of the major positives of the uh, Indian device is that it allows you to uh, sit on your haunches. Mm -hmm. So, little things like that that are um, not obvious um, are, are some of the things that we see taking uh, this approach. So, we primarily look. Um, at uh, generic devices. So the three device areas we've invested in, four actually, um, one is orthopedics, one is sutures and wound care, and, a, um, and a, another one is cardiac stents. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, uh, the stent is pure low cost play. Um, and and the, we, we believe that we are the low co lowest cost manufacturer and a, a bet we are taking, uh, which again I realize in this audience is, is, and I've been on both sides. I was at Roche for many years, thought generics were terrible. So I can see both sides. Um, in fact, what I loved about Roche was that we didn't allow generic substitution in our, in our health plan. So anyway, actually. Um, so, so I'm on both sides of this. Um, so the, the, the government may be bringing in uh, price uh, 
uh, reimbursement, which would uh, advantage the, the lower cost. The local. Um, there has been a conflation of low cost or design for India with low quality. There's people in India, and I, you know, or I don't, can't speak for other countries, but they do feel that they're getting something at the bottom of the barrel, and they're, um, and so that is something that a lot of the, the, um, I don't know, Jane, if you've had, the, the, but, but there's a degree of suspicion. Whereas if you're doing using an indigenous device that's developed in an Indian company, they kind of feel like, oh yeah, it's it's low cost, but it somebody didn't. Just, It'll work. Yeah, it yeah. probably will work yeah. because m most of these devices, in, in, uh, interestingly, get 510k <coughs> approval mm -hmm. um, because so that they can show that they have met uh, some mm -hmm. uh, clearance. I should say, not approval. Right. So that is the sort of one interesting thing. And a couple of very quick things. Um, medical devices are hugely underpenetrated in India, unlike drugs. Um, so it is a huge market. MNCs dominate the market. Um, the Indian uh, manufacturing is just emerging, but it's a very exciting space. Um, and there are a huge dearth of surgeons or people who can uh, implant or use the devices. So these are, these are two er things. And the third big area is distribution. So there is a huge imbalance with uh, the cities having pretty good care and then a, a sort of a total lack of care. So the penetration in rural areas is, is, is two different countries. Right. Um, and one last thing is that India is financially three different countries. So there are 200 million wealthy people. And they, we, we, you know, most of our car companies cater to the 200 million who, can pay, who pay out of pocket, right? And, but our hospitals also, and our, our companies do provide some trickle down effect to uh, raising the whole healthcare system and, and we have some government insured patients. There are people in the middle and then there are 500 million very, so of the 1.2 billion, 500 million very, very lacking. Very access lacking. To care. But they're sizable, there's a sizable right. self-pay, right. which again is very different to the US. Yeah. So I wanna um, tug on that string a little bit about um, innovation and having empathy and being on the ground and learning differently because I think a lot of us um, are great at researching markets, are great at understanding what um, clinical unmet needs are, but what I'm hearing from all of you is being on the ground and really seeing it firsthand can, can change how you think. So I'm wondering, um, at thoughts from any of the panelists around, what surprised you? What, what did you learn uh, about innovation that taught you to do something different as a result of being on the ground and working with local clinicians and really seeing things firsthand? Any observations? Maybe Dane or, or Carolyn to start? Well, I can start up. Actually, uh, I'll even take a step back from before my current company. I launched a, a nonprofit, and even going back even further than that to my first time spending time with clinicians was in India, um, where I brought a medical device, a centrifuge made out of bicycle parts, over to India. And I thought, okay, we I even got a lot of support and funding as, as students working on this project, and thought it was a fabulous idea, you know locally sourced materials, report, repurposing them for like a new medical need, found out it was a dreadful idea <laughs> over multiple iterations in the sense of like the bicycle is actually really valuable in itself. You're, uh, we knew that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so don't get rid of the bike. <laughs> don't yeah. get rid of the bike. Um, also, there's a lot of dignity in, in going to, to receive care in the sense of if you're gonna pay exorbitant fees to a certain extent. If you're, if you're, you're gonna spend, if you have $1 left, you're gonna spend that on a better healthcare outcome for yourself or for your family or for your friend. And so seeing something that doesn't look like a medical device is actually really detrimental um, to that confidence of that patient and knowing that they're receiving a quality result. So through the iteration of kind of you know, you were saying Western perspective of kind of devices on just making something cheaper, or just making it locally available, isn't enough. Y yes, there are elements of that, but it's really been a learning process of just figuring out, you know, 
again, empathy, I think, putting yourself in that patient's shoes and, and seeing how to design a product to their needs and to the high quality standards that you would expect as that patient going in for that, that health care. So Jane, to, uh, maybe a little bit on that, that's very interesting because how did you, you, you brought your, your um, warmer, but how, how did you get that buy-in that this would be valuable and it would work? Yeah, a lot of it was uh, just uh, co-creating, as I said, so really getting buy-in from the stakeholders, getting their inputs, and then incorporating that feedback into the product itself. So one story I often tell about our design, and this is a nuance that's very important, uh, but on the wax pouch I showed you, there's a temperature indicator um, that tells you when the pouch is too hot or too cold and when you need to reheat it. Um, and it's an LCD that, that changes color. So it, initially, it was a numeric scale that went from 30 to 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, and then as we showed this to, to mothers and villages, uh, we heard this comment that we were never expected to hear, hear sitting here in Palo Alto. Uh, mothers would say to us, we don't trust Western medicine. If you told me to give a dosage of medicine to my baby, I would cut it in half because it's too strong. So if you told me to keep this at 37 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Fahrenheit, I'd keep it at a little less than that because it's probably too warm. Um, so that led to a very important design decision to make it a binary okay, not okay, as opposed to a numeric scale. So again, I think those nuances are really what makes um, uh, design uh, locally appropriate. Um, the other story I'll share, and a, a big aha for me, initially we went into India um, as we were creating this, thinking that we wanted to create something that could be used in homes by mothers, given the fact that so many births still take place in the home in, the, in these countries. I think it's 50% of births in India now take place in a home setting. Um, but as we got to the ground in India, we realized that we were dealing with a largely uneducated, illiterate population, and we got really scared it, what if something went wrong? What if the baby were injured? So instead, we made a design that could first be used in a clinical setting by doctors. We launched that first. And it was only about a year later um, that we introduced the product that could be used at home by the mothers. And it was really interesting because we would go out into the field, we'd train mothers and doctors on how to use it. Uh, and then a week later, we'd come back and we'd do a training assessment to make sure they had retained the knowledge. Um, and, and guess who it was who performed the best across the board on this training? Exactly, it was the mothers. And it was just a reminder to me to design for the people who are the most motivated to solve the problem. Um, and in this case, it's the mothers. And I think that that's something that we often forget and was a big aha moment for me for being on the ground. Hmm. Interesting. He's been speaking, I actually was thinking of another aha moment that's <laughs> directly more um, uh, applicable for, for our product element to kind of our, our current company is, again, in that perspective of designing for um, the resources and areas that we're in and kind of what we expect from similarly kind of Western um, standards and kind of what's actually how things are used. Um, we came in with the original prototypes, the original mentors went in thinking that the device should be fully disposable. You're talking a surgical tool, it's contacting blood, you want to reduce any risk of kind of blood exposure or transferring diseases. And then, you know, actually observing, we, we watch, they often will sterilize and reuse um, kind of the tubing in between devices. Disposable gloves will often be reused. Japago, uh, a large nonprofit, actually done protocols on how to safely reuse disposable gloves just because of it. not only the supply chain and infrastructure, but just using materials more effectively. We dispose of so much in the U.S. And so in our design process, we realized that we had to make our device reusable just for the idea of um, kind of the long-term use because it would likely be reused whether we wanted it to or not. Uh, so we, in that design process, really started minimizing like, okay, how can we reduce that consumable portion as much as possible um, to have a kind of a multi-use device and a, a small disposable component. Josie, I see you nodding your no, head. No. So I'm, I'm guessing you face this um, in Russia and maybe now in Peru where you're trying to train, mm -hmm. but maybe some of the standards or the, the practices are different. So how do you have to modify your, your innovation? What, what I'm nodding to is, is the importance of listening um, and, and, under, and recognizing and acknowledging your natural stakeholders. And 
So the example that came to my mind when I was hearing what people were talking about is the use of milrinone, which is an FDA-approved uh, drug for in the ICU to increase cardiac output, which is not available in Russia um, or Peru. And initially, um, you know, it's very easy to when you've got this super high standard of care to go to a um, a developing environment and, and say, why aren't they doing this? Or why is this patient in the ICU so long? Um, but if you take a step back and you, you watch and you listen, they're aware that they don't have milrinone and they're using something else and it may take a little bit longer, but to watch and to listen and to understand the context so that you can, so that your training and education makes that much more sense and you can, you can it can lead to success. Um, the other, the other one that was uh, really interesting is uh, we're really big on data collection and using um, metrics that are standard industry in this country to assess progress at our sites over, uh, I think I mentioned five to seven years. And initially, one of our um, data fields is length of stay in the ICU and length of stay in the hospital. Well, the initial response for somebody who isn't familiar with um, developing cardiac care in a developing area is how could this patient have been in the hospital for so long? Well, it's because it took the patient family, uh, you know, six days by train to get there, and there is nobody to go back to for follow-up care. So the the local team is not going to let that patient go to their credit until they are absolutely sure that it's it's the best time to let the patient go. So, mm -hmm. kind of the American mindset is, well, why isn't that patient? Ha why hasn't that patient been? Yeah. So really being on the ground and listening and looking at the whole context and the, the tools that are available or, or aren't available and always working toward that same goal of making them self-sufficient in their environment. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if I might. Um, Absolutely. Um, the, in addition to empathy, um, I think it's important to rid ourselves of the mindset that we are better or we have something better. That is very much resented. And it, and, um, it is it, it, so. For example, we use you know we joke about it in India all the time because you know the the country of disposables. Well, we are now suddenly realizing that we should be reusing, but we were preaching that they should be um, throwing away, right? And then suddenly now we suddenly have this aha moment: we should be recycling. But they've been recycling all along and reusing. So I think there's so many there's a accumulation of these kinds of examples, or length of stay is a good example, because people should stay longer. They're getting pushed out too early here, I think. But, um, <coughs> but we, we really have to be more of a blank slate rather than thinking of it. And there is, I don't know how to say this politely, there is- <laughs> You're among friends. <laughs> there, there is a, 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 a slight resentment to the people coming with, um, I'm, I'm coming to tell you watching what you need and I'm going to make something for you to fit your needs. And you know, they, it's, there is a s slight discomfort with that. And what I see is an adoption problem a lot of times, and it is not necessarily rational. Um, uh, you know, and so I think, I think, um, uh, I think the way way for, uh, forward is to have combined teams where it's not a mm -hmm. directionality. Also, I think, you know, people have pride and, and dignity and, and I think as, as we also adopt some lessons from India or, or wherever else, this will become more of a two-way rather than one way. And, and this is a subtle point, but it is so important. Yeah. And I see it all the time. It's a great point. So, Sanaz, I'm, I'm going to follow up and ask you that. You're at a big Western company that um, obviously is well known around the globe. So how have you found through the Innovation Fellowship or the Global Health Initiatives at Medtronic, how are you able to bridge that, that divide and partner with local organizations in a way that the um, programs you bring are welcomed right. and are, are thought of as value add for the local markets. Right. So <clears throat> the um, Global Innovation Fellowship is the program that I participated in a couple years ago where I spent a month in South Africa. It's actually been running for four years now. And through that program, we have about 90 Medtronic employees that have gone out into 12 different countries and partnered with tw 20 different um, local organizations. Some of these projects are scoped out to partner with 
nonprofits, um, some with government. Uh, so really, just even at that starting point, you're getting insight into how are healthcare policies changed? How are um, um, innovations introduced into the healthcare innovation into the healthcare system? Because the governments play a big role. The local nonprofits actually play a very big role. Um, and so, for us, it was. It wasn't an issue really for us, I think, because from the get-go it was designed as a partnership. partnership. Um, that we were coming in and we were going to listen and we were going to observe and we were going to interview and provide whatever resources, talent, and, and um, tools we could. So when you're working with a local nonprofit, I mean, it's essentially one person running the show. She's working 15 to 18 hours a day. So she was just so grateful to have five um, sets of eyes and hands out there. And we also bring a different mindset, right? So we were in and out of, in a three-week period, I think, five hospitals, um, and we spoke to about 50 people, and just observing, interviewing, um, talking to people. And so any little insights that we could present her with, um, tools, uh, was, was actually quite welcomed. And there are some, you would be amazed. I mean, the whole continuum of care is completely different, right? So in, in this community we were in, there were actually you know, six levels of care before they got to a specialist. So there's your primary care provider, which is usually someone in the family, like the mother. Um, and then there's a community health worker, and then there's a community clinic, and then there's a nurse at the hospital, then there's a doctor at the hospital, then there's the specialist at the hospital. And these are, these are underserved um, populations where they're living on less than $10 a day, and so they don't have the means to get to the hospital. So you have overburdened systems with patients that don't have a means to get there. So that brings all the care down into the communities. Um, but these community care workers just don't have the resources. So they don't have the materials to educate the, the patients about diet. This was a diabetes focused, about diet and nutrition and self-care. So it just perpetuates the problem more and more and more. Um, and so really getting the insights into the flow of care and where can you introduce you know, tools, information, education down at that community level is where you're gonna have the largest impact. Mm -hmm. And just some basic, basic tools, the nonprofit that we worked with um, ran diabetes screening programs. So we said, okay, show us your protocols. Protocols? We don't have protocols. Um, we need to collect data because we wanna get funding from the government. Well, you've been running these programs for years. I'm sure you have a huge database database? We don't have a database. So just some, some simple tools, right? So we created a protocol. We create a kind of systemized the process. We um, built out a format for a database, things like that, that then gives them a good foundation to, one, increase the impact of their current programs, and two, um, generate data and evidence to get government funding to then um, have sustainable funding coming in. Great. Did you have a thought there? Yeah, yeah I had a thought. Um, so um, we often hear about um, developing areas that are, like you said, um, very rural and maybe where a database is um, a novel thought or that kind of thing. But I just want to encourage everybody to remember that there are about 200 countries um, on Earth. And some of them, there are various stages of development. And one thing that's been really interesting working in the cardiac um, world is that some of them are, are not ready for even databases um, or patient tracking or that kind of thing, and others are ready for transcatheter valves. And there's this incredible spectrum, and depending on what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish and what value added you're trying to bring, there's probably a, a, you know, an area of the world that is kind of just right in terms of, of where they're at in their um, development. I think it's a great point. Um, the other thing I'm hearing from all of you is that in looking at innovation models differently, it's important to figure out where in the system your innovation fits. Because you can easily design you know, a less expensive incubator, but that's not where the need is. The need is out in the community um, with moms or looking at diabetes care that patients can't get all the way to the hospital. And I think the Western um, approach is often to look at specialists first and really get the cream of the crop to answer our unmet needs questions. And what I think I'm hearing from a lot of you today is that it's more about tracking back through the entire healthcare process and looking at innovation where it's going to matter most. Um, have you received feedback when you've been out in the field 
um, around innovation that, that what you're doing is different? Uh, have you found that you're a trailblazer out there, or are you finding that there are other um, um, sisters in arms who are also out there um, doing similar things? I'm, I'm curious uh, the responses at the local level. And maybe Josie, since you've um, just started in a new market, what's that like for you? And, and I'll ask the others as well. Um, well, to answer the question about something that's, that sticks out in terms of um, that we don't see other people necessarily doing and that has been appreciated by the local um, groups that we're working to, to bring up to speed with in cardiac care is the use and, um, and kind of, um, the, the use and total um, integration of best practices and getting a, a medical team to work completely as a team is a really interesting approach and something that um, in some ways, in certain, I can't say that every hospital is great at that in the US. I mean, Reggie shared some really painful um, painful points. But, in, but it is something that we do have available and it is something that we can teach and we, that's kind of a, um, a cornerstone for what we do is involving every single discipline in patient care decisions and um, it's, Definitely something that has been new in pretty much every hospital we've, we've been to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add on a little bit onto that in terms of um, it, how we've seen some of being unique is a lot of the hospitals we work with and kind of the main surgical centers in kind of more of the lower middle income countries across Sub Saharan Africa is that what they've seen a lot of is donor equipment. Um, a lot of, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, they've seen a lot of medical devices that are kind of shipped over there. Um, but it, we've seen also a lot of what has termed medical device graveyards for the stoner equipment. So Jane, I think, touched on that at the very early stages of kind of the, that incubator that's not working in the corner. We've seen rooms full of surgical equipment, uh, similarly, that just isn't functioning because they didn't have, say, the paper for a diagnostic machine. And it's, there are not really great nonprofits that are creating medical devices with these communities as well. But when it comes to the next stage of kind of that commercialization and scale is where a lot of these medical devices fall short. Because if you, you know, if you create a great product, you can't get it out. I mean, I know we're talking a lot about design, but really you have to be intentional about what that commercial path is from the very beginning. Um, and that's really unique. And it's also really unique to uh, our product. We're planning, we're working with local regulatory bodies and local governments. And that's really rare in, for example, Ghana, where a medical device approved by their own regulatory body um, is, is not common or necessarily well understood, especially coming from an outside country, because most companies will go through the US FDA, sell in the US market, and kind of bring that device in or in a different market. Um, and I, I also, on the comment of kind of looking at the what, what area and what niche you're fitting in, um, I think I really love Josie's comment on um, not everyone is, not every product is going to work in every place um, and kind of really focusing and honing on who that market is, um, is pretty important as well. I want to leave time for the audience. So um, while you're thinking about questions, maybe Jane, last word on, um, on, on kind of what you've seen in your experiences. And if you have questions, please raise your hand. We'll, we'll get to you. There's probably some mics that will go around the room as well. Yeah, I think for us what we realize is <clears throat> um, there's a difference between need and demand. And it's not so easy as if you, know, if you build it, they will come. But there's actually a big behavior change component involved in this. And so many of the clinics we were working in use hot water bottles or light bulbs. These are dangerous, often dangerous and ineffective solutions. However, there's still an education process that comes along with introducing an innovation into the market. Uh, and so a lot of our work in the early days was um, uh, educating doctors and really being in these facilities and having staff on site that was helping, helping to make sure that that behavior change um, happened in the end. Uh, I remember one of the medical um, uh, colleges that we worked in initially 
uh, we got, we go back and check on the product and kind of just be sitting there. And it took our staff being there and really educating um, all of the doctors there to over time, a few months later, uh, I was pleasantly surprised one day when I walked into the neonatal intensive care unit and there on the kind of standard protocols had you know all the things you do with the baby and the last step was wrap the baby in the embrace warmer. Um, but that was kind of the process it took for it to become a standard of care in those settings. Um, I just wanted to make one last remark on, um, uh, someone commented earlier about thinking through distribution and, and business models, and that is really, really critical as well. And I think something that we didn't think um, uh, through well enough in the early days of the process. Um, so given that we're working oftentimes with clinics in rural areas, the government controls most of that healthcare infrastructure. <coughs> And that meant in India, 99% uh, of our, uh, our business was coming through the government, uh, which was working well in the first couple years. And then 2014 happened. It was a national election year in India. And basically, all of our business stopped. No budgets were allocated until the prime minister was chosen. All of the health ministers then changed hands. And so we were back to square one. And it really set us back. Um, and so it was for that reason that about seven months ago, we actually launched a new line of our business. Uh, it's a for-profit in the US. Um, it's called Little Lotus, and we're making baby swaddles, sleeping bags, and blankets for healthy babies in the US using a technology akin to the Embrace Warmers. So the fabric of these products is lined with microns of wax, which absorbs or releases heat to keep babies at an ideal skin temperature thereby helping them to sleep better. Uh, but the best part of it, and the impetus for doing this was so we could institute a one-for-one -one model. So for every product we sell here in the US, we help to save the life of a baby in a developing country. Uh, and it's through this initiative that we're hoping we can scale our reach to a million babies um, and beyond. So for any of, the, of you that have babies, uh, check out Little Lotus. <laughs> can I say awesome. one thing to Caroline's point? Yes, and questions to, uh, well, Anya, okay, we have one in the back. So just real quick, please. So as opposed to the, the process you identified, FDA, US, and backwards, all our companies do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. So they market in India and developing world, come back here to get either a CE mark or 510K. And there is a lot of innovation happening in devices in India, which we haven't had a chance to talk about. But that's another element than us going yeah. from right. here to, to India. To there. Yeah. Great. Question in the back. Hi, Anne Luke from CardioDX, and we have some questions from the app. And if you're wondering how to participate in the app, um, there's actually on the back sheet of your cheat sheet, there's directions on how to join the live discussion, um, basically just sessions and um, type in your question. And you can also upvote for questions that you want to hear. Um, so we have two questions that came in through, um, and I think it alluded to some of the conversation that happened earlier in, in this panel. Um, one is, what are the top three needs of med tech to be designed for the emerging markets? I heard electricity-free devices. What are the other top two needs? Any thoughts from the group? Um, uh, places where there aren't doctors. So telemedicine is actually working really well in India because there is a true need. And also phone-based um, diagnostics and so, such things, again, work because of lack of uh, penetration. So those are success stories, I think, that have had more traction there than here. I would echo um, what Anwa is saying, because there's actually been a couple of efforts um, through <coughs> um, both this uh, innovation fellowship as well as another corporate initiative where they're using app-based technologies to essentially do more remote management of um, uh, hypertension and other, and other disease states, but basically the bottom line is removing the burden off of the healthcare system. Um, so bringing care up front again so that you don't have to um, overburden the healthcare system and, and get patients to the specialist. So using app-based technology to be able to provide that care um, remotely. Second question? Second question. Okay, framing the question properly is critically important for medtech design as well as getting to the top universal needs. How do you get to the primary universal needs? Do you segment by country? Those are two questions embedded in there. Yeah. So maybe, um, Anala, you mentioned you ask a question differently. You, at, at the beginning of our conversation, you said it's hard to ask doctors what they need. So tell us a little bit about how you ask that question differently. And then maybe for the others, <coughs> did you segment by region or unmet need? How did you think about your approach? 
I ask a very pragmatic question. Nothing, nothing uh, as um, uh, ambitious as what you need. I ask what motivates you to use whatever it is that you're using. And uh, especially, uh, I think everywhere, there are uh, hidden, um, usually financial incentives mm -hmm. that drive care. And when you ask someone what, would, what do you want, they think in an abstract world that's devoid of, devoid of all of these other um, aspects. So I start with what the drivers are and then get rid of them and then ask for what you might need. But I, I, what motivates you? I go to the financial incentives right away. Mm -hmm. Good. Any other thoughts on that question? Yeah. It, I, love that any point from Anula in terms of starting with the drivers and what they mean. I think that's really how we start. I think starting and scaling are two different pieces. So in segmenting, we're starting with where we see the, that motivation being the greatest and also where the demand and kind of people who are willing to go to the ends of the earth to use our, our product and are willing to take maybe a little bit bigger risk um, to be the first pe people to use our device. Um, and so that's why even we're, we're starting in our first study in Ethiopia, where the device is going to be used for the first time in surgery in just these next couple of weeks. And then to scale, then it's less, it, the drivers are still really important, but then distribution plays a lot heavier role. So then we are regionalizing our focus on, you know, how, what areas can we reach most efficiently and effectively. So we're looking at kind of West Africa and East Africa, but even looping that back to the drivers we need, if there is a particular region or area or country that has the need, the market, to make it interesting to our company, we will kind of take a sidestep to that, that other country to, to kind of address that, that demand. Okay. Any other last questions from the audience? We have one up front. at some point or uh, do you have them go or is it just for adoption? <laughs> so many different ways, but um, we, primarily we're helping them grow. We, we are giving growth capital. That takes on many different um, aspects. So it could be to market it. Many of them sell in the US, not device companies. Um, I'm talking about but the drug companies but also they sell in about 70 uh, mid-regulated markets. We call them um, the, the um, like all like Bhutan, in Sri Lanka, um, African countries and so forth. So we help them go into new markets. We also help them with the acquiring new technologies in areas that they want to, so in many different ways. But it is growth that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So you help them partner with companies uh, some, yes, um, often we do, but we are also looking at markets in the developing world. Um, and so that, that we're not just West focused, we're looking at growth anywhere there that they can grow. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much to a great panel. Uh, Jane Chen has misplaced an iPhone. Um, if you find an iPhone, you know it's not yours. Give it back. Okay, while we're transitioning to the next panel, we're gonna mic them up. Thank you for following my instructions exactly, people in the corner. Um, I wanna hit on a couple of points that I heard. So those of you who know me outside of work and outside of MedTech Vision know that my better half of 17 years is an architect designer here on the peninsula. And um, one of the things I've noticed about her process when she speaks to a new client is she spends hours, I'm, I don't, I'm not exaggerating, she spends hours going in their home with them, looking at how they live, walking into their closets with them, asking them what do they do when they get up in the morning, um, having them fill out surveys and sort of track their movements through the house. I mean, it's this very 
very comprehensive process of understanding how someone lives. And I don't know, it, it took me about 15 years to figure out what was going on there. And I uh, thought, well, that seems like a lot of work. Um, and then she explained to me that uh, the reason she does that is because to be an effective designer of the most important part of your life, which is your home, um, you need to design it for the user, which may seem obvious, but you're not just designing it for the user, you're designing it for where they are. You're showing up where they are in their life and you're going right there. And for her to do that, that's how she does that. And so that's what I'm hearing here and I think we're going to hear themes of that throughout the day, which is when we think about you know, globalization of technologies that are still largely developed in the Western world, it's not about taking what we imagine they need and going there and giving to them. It's showing up where they are, immersing in that, and um, going from there. And I think we're going to hear that theme over and over. And so good news, it only took me 15 years to learn that. I'm seeing it every day at my house. But I'm hoping that those of us who don't already know that today will get it today.